Good morning. Take your hymn books if you would. Page number 22. Christ is all I need. A little bit higher there, Trey, if you would. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. Page number 22. Stand with us if you would on that chorus. Page number 22. We were waiting for him right there. Here we go. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All, all I need. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. on that second he was crucified for me he died on Calvary that he loved me so this is why I know reading is Psalm 98, verses 1 through 3. O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of of our God. Blessed Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your salvation, which you have given to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is he who comes to you on bended knee, proclaiming Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, is free from their sins. And we have access to the throne room of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For it is in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Take your hymn books, page 477, The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Page 477. Sing out if you would. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, His covenant, His blood, Support me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way He then is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, all blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground 
is sinking sun. Page 411, if you would. Page 411. Look and live, my Bob Gallino live. Page 411. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. We'll sing the first verse, and then we'll greet one another on the next two. On the first, if you will. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. The message unto you I'll give is recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Get around, greet one another on the next couple of verses. We'll come back and we'll sing the rest. On that fourth verse, on that fourth and final verse, I will tell you how I came. I will tell you how I came, hallelujah, to Jesus when he made me whole. T'was believing on his name, hallelujah, I trusted and he saved my soul. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. It's recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. You believe that this morning? Say amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you very much. Good to have you here today, and what happened? Folks, second weekend after Easter, the, the second weekend plunge. Uh, not very many, but uh, anyway, good to have... Anyway, um, good to have you here this evening, this morning, excuse me. I'm, I'm here, it's today. Good to have you here. How about that? Amen. And uh, get around, look around, see who's missing. Give them a call later. Text them. Say, why weren't you here, you compromiser? Uh, you know, something like that. So I'm just kidding. Some of them probably are compromisers. But anyway, regardless of that, where is Ron? Oh, there he is right there. I like how you get... 
Oh, there's your theme music. Yep. There you go. Uh, it's good. stuff up there that I've already written out, though, all right? Yeah, the men's group. Oh, where is he? He's not here, but I am. Oh, okay, good. And Bob is, <laughs> right? We're here. Um, we're talking about the men's group on Thursday, the prayer breakfast, right? And so 7 o'clock again, and so we have a good time. We pray for each other, pray for the church and our community, too, our families, and do a little devotional. Um, May 7th, that's the 5th. May 7th is uh, uh, Freedom's Way Ladies Fellowship at 9 a.m. Um, May 8th, Mother's Day Sunday. All mothers in attendance will receive a awesome free gift. Uh, the 8th also, well, there's a little laugh back there, um, is also the Baby Bottles uh, Boomerang, right, in support of SCV, and that's important. It's a good... Uh, uh, to, to give to, to donate to. Um, May 29th, Memorial Day service. Join us as we briefly honor those who have given the ultimate sacrifice and still will um, in the future too uh, for our liberty and our freedoms. Uh, June 5th, uh, Pastor Jim Preston will be speaking in the AM services. Um, June 17th, Father's Day Sunday. And is there a gift for the fathers? Yes, we're going to get fast pro yes. cards. Yes. Uh, $100 a piece. Yes. <laughs> All right. And then uh, be back tonight at 5 p.m. Uh, for some good preaching and uh, teaching from God's Word. Man, man, I can't wait to be back tonight either. By the way, today is my final day out of Simi Valley. And not my final day in Simi Valley, but my final day... Uh, we'll need you for the barrier bucket, Aloy, so just don't like walk away and you know all that kind of stuff like that. I like when he does that. I'm going to just, just one second. That's my favorite part of Aloy's life. Revelation 4.11, I think it's up on the screen. Maybe not. Uh, they can give it to you. If not, look it up in your Bible. Uh, well, let's prepare to give this morning as the Lord has graciously given to you. Let's sing out that chorus, if you would. Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created, hast all things created. Thou hast created all things. And for Thy pleasure they are created. For Thou art worthy, O Lord. Amen. Good singing. Dr. Laramore, why don't you stand and ask God's blessing, if you would, sir. Amen. All right, kiddos, bear your bucket. Here they go. Okay, very good. All right. I'm glad he's doing that. All right. Well, uh, even though we do have a, a lower crowd today, it doesn't matter because today is the first Sunday, the first day of May. And there's plenty of birthdays to be had in May, specifically one that I'm thinking of right now. I don't know. Maybe we'll save that for later. 
So who's who's got a birthday in the month of May? Tristan? So on Tuesday, Tristan's got a birthday. And you know what you're getting? A haircut. That's what you're getting. Uh, no, that's good. That's good. That's good. Uh, who, who, who says child Gentile can up the preacher? All right, that's good. T, May 20th. All right, T. For, all right. Uh, yes, dear? May 8th. Julie? 27th. Who's got another? Dennis? May 6th. All right. Hey, in honor of you. Oh, no, I messed that up. Never mind. It's not going to be on Sunday. All right. Scott? Kodish? 26. What was yours? Oh, okay. I saw another hand way back there. Was there another hand behind Scott? Christian? No? Nobody back there? How about over here? May. And then there's one on May 16. But we won't really mention that one. All right, let's say happy birthday to these folks. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday. Yes. All right. Who got married on a hot and heavy May evening? Anybody get? Mark? And, and your wife, were you with each other that day? Are you sure of it? Just remember, Julie, when he dies, you come into a lot of chocolate. All right, anyway. Not dark chocolate, hopefully. Hopefully it's milk chocolate. Because we want to die with good chocolate, not that dark stuff. All right, anybody else got a... How many, how many years, Mark? I'm sorry? Ten. All right. Ten years. All right. Anybody else got an anniversary for the month of March? I, uh, month of May. I'm sorry. I'm already way ahead. All right. Let's sing happy anniversary to just the Hershey's who are celebrating a decade. Here we go. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary! Ah, yes, wonderful, the Hershey's. What day is it, Mark? The twenty-fifth. What are you going to do now that you're at uh, now that you're at the double digits? Oh, okay. I, I thought maybe you'd go take her to watch that new movie, Two Thousand Mules. I'm thinking about taking my wife to see that this week. D Dinesh D'Souza. So I'm supposedly he's got the goods on something here. So I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it. All right. I am not going to preach right now. I am going to now turn the microphone over to Tim Lamaster and, and the family for those who'd like to participate. Today is officially Tim Lamaster and Diana Lamaster's last Sunday with us. I know it. I know they were actually supposed to be gone a month ago, but they've loved us so much that they had to stick with us. And but you know, as sales of homes go, uh, the closing of the escrow is always the problem, right? And so there's always some sort of hiccup. So anyway, dates have been pushed back, and so on and so forth. But anyway, I'm going to ask Tim if you'd like to speak for the entire family. You can, or your wife can come up with you. It doesn't matter. She can speak. But uh, go ahead and give us a quick testimony. Of, uh, I think they've been with us since the, uh, I think the end of 2013, early 2014. So it, it's been a while. So yeah, eight new beginnings. Yeah, now you're there. Well, this is uh, this is hard. 
And uh, we just want to tell you how much we love you and how much uh, we appreciate your love back to us. It's been an, it's been an amazing time. Uh, Pastor said two minutes, so start your watches. All right, here we go. Bob will do it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> we came here eight years ago looking for a good church, <clears throat> and we kind of found something very unique. And two things I want to bring out. One <clears throat> is I was looking for a shepherd pastor. I really was. You've got all kinds of pastors all over the place, but I wanted a shepherd pastor. And what I mean by that is somebody who cares about you and your spiritual life and will direct and guide you in the right way. I wanted a pastor who believed in the word of God and actually would change, change if they needed to when they saw the scriptures revealed to them. And I appreciate our pastor for he has shown that to me. Uh, he's told me about Calvinism and other things, and we've gone around, and, and it's been fantastic, and I appreciate that very much. And I just, I just appreciate the shepherd heart, and I, and I appreciate his, his desire to open the Word of God and only preach it, not follow the rest of the crowd, not go along with what other churches are doing. He doesn't do that, okay? And I appreciate that extremely uh, a lot. And I appreciate having a choir in this church. It's rare. OK, and I hope and pray that it will continue so people don't give up to keep going and uh, keep working in that goal. So anyway, that's, that's it. We'll miss you, too, Tim. Thank you. And <laughs>How's the house coming along, Andrew? Been good? Is it looking less lived in and a little more new? Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, kiddos, you're dismissed this morning. There you go. What a blessing you are. We do have quite a few folks missing today. In fact, I was going to talk to a few folks, and they're not here. So we'll just... Give that up for right now. Take your Bibles, if you would, go to Proverbs chapter 22. I don't know how this message is going to go over today, but uh, I'm going to preach it anyway. Amen. I have no idea. Um, Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 6. Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 6. And then we're going to spend the majority of our time in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, if you'd like to just also keep your finger there. Ephesians chapter 5. But first we'll look at Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 6. The Bible says, very familiar passage of Scripture, you all know it, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. America's descending transformation into a sissified society is on full display literally on a daily basis. When Gen Z has a mental and emotional breakdown simply because Elon Musk purchased Twitter and has encouraged a return to, quote, free speech, which is amazing that in our country we have to return to anything, these Gen Z minds, full of mush, demanded days off of work in order to grieve and cope with the purchase of Twitter. I don't think they could handle the beaches of Normandy. Women's liberation, as promoted by Hollywood, politicians, academia, and the ever-accommodating news media, has basically turned men into sissies, cowards, and emotional snowflakes where your opinion is a trigger, uh, your preference is a trigger, where they can't handle certain things because, well, it triggers them. They have to take days off of work. True manly influence in the home is becoming a rarity. Millions of homes with fathers have wimpy fathers at best, and a great many homes have no father figures at all. On the, one, on the one hand, in an effort to have it all and be it all, 
Some women have to be godly and modest Christian ladies that God has called them to be at the same time. Consequently, Satan has turned the average American family into a mutated mess. Both boys and girls are being cheated by some of the sorry examples that they get at home. So I asked the question this morning, how can parents raise a family in today's confused, gender-bending culture that is anti-God, anti-Bible, and yes, anti-science? This morning, I'd like to give you three pieces of advice that, if followed, will help and will increase your chances of raising saints instead of sissies in your house. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to look at your word. Father, it is our desire today to be introspective, Father, not to judge everybody else, but Father, to be introspective. What do we need to do to address our particular situations? Father, again, it's so easy, as we've done here just at the introduction to this sermon, it's so easy to point out the problems outside of this wall, but Father, there might be many problems within these walls. And Father, we pray that you might allow us, Father, to see via your word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God to make those changes as you see fit. Father, we want to raise godly children in the midst of a crazy, confused, and convoluted culture. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we ask it all, and all God's people said, Amen. Again, our sermon this morning is entitled Raising Sissies or Raising Saints. Now, the first thing I want to just mention is first and foremost, uh, try not to get too confused with this word saints, uh, because obviously when you think of your own children, that may not be the word that immediately pops up. Uh, but, but the fact is, if your children or if you, mom and dad, happen to be born-again Christians, then you, by biblical definition, are a saint. Say amen. Uh, you're, not, uh, you're not given sainthood by any particular group, right? Uh, if you'll notice, you don't need to turn there, but in just about every letter that Paul writes, he always, as any letter would, uh, starts off with an introductory, and he'll say this, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Paul calls the believers at the church at Corinth saints. He calls the believers at the churches of Rome saints. He calls the believers at the church of Ephesus saints. Why? Because if you are a child of God, you are by definition a saint. You didn't get that title through some church. It wasn't given to you because you're dead and somehow some, in some, uh, they looked at your life and said, well, he did this good thing or she did this good thing and so we're going to give them sainthood. No, we get our sainthood through the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't get too confused by that word saints. It's very possible to raise saints. But it's also very possible to raise sissies. And that is something that a word that doesn't get used often anymore. Uh, in the 80s, it, was, it rolled off of my tongue quite often. Uh, it probably rolled off of some of your tongues quite often. Uh, but the fact is, we don't say it anymore because people get triggered by words like sissy. But may I say that it takes effort to raise saints... And it takes really no effort to raise sissies. 
And because it takes effort, and work is a four-letter word people really have an aversion to, they'd much rather go with the default and just go ahead and raise sissies and allow the culture to dictate to them how they should live and in what manner they should go. So this morning, what I'd like to do just for the next few moments, and again, this will not be a long sermon, but I think it will be a sermon that equally offends everybody. I think that's a good thing. It's good to be equally offended so we can all walk out of here knowing that some piece of us was taken care of by God. Amen? Instead of just saying, you dads, or just walking out of here saying, you moms, I think all of us could get something from God's Word today. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 21, if you will. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 21. I want you to listen to a very familiar passage of Scripture. In fact, as I'm, as I'm reading it, you're going to say to yourself, I know what this passage says, says, Pastor. It's so boring, I could have gone to real life church where they were going to tell us the spiritual application of the notebook movie. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 21. When you're there, say amen. If you're not there, just look up on the screen, amen? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. If there was one piece of advice I could give you this morning, and there's three of them. The first is this. Fathers must rule their home. Fathers must rule their home. There is no substitute for God's order of things. If you do things God's way, things will ultimately and end up to work out better. If you do things according to the latest fad, then it will only breed confusion, cause dysfunction, and yes, perhaps even lead to emotional and psychological trauma in the life of the kids who have no authority or standard. I was just reading a, uh, an editorial the other day from Victor Davis Hansen, who wrote a wonderful editorial about why we're living in, quote, la-la land. And he was talking about how in 2017, uh, some of the things that were plaguing kids uh, were basic things, like things in school and being bullying, uh, bullied in, a, in, a, in, in, the, in the playground or something like that. By the way, things we've all been plagued with for decades, if not years. But today, there was a, the latest study is that kids are now starting to want to commit suicide because they're confused about their identity. See, if you don't do things according to the final authority and you just end up going with the latest fad, and I mean latest, all you need to do is wake up every day and there's another latest fad that's coming along the theological pike or the secular pike, and people will just kind of jump onto it and say, all right, I guess little Charlie wants to be Charlene. Or maybe, or maybe <laughs> Susie wants to be Steve. Or any number of other genders that you can choose. There is no substitute for fathers ruling their home. So how is this done? By obeying the order God set up. But first, we must address how sissy preachers address the passage we just read. 
So let's go back to Ephesians 5, and I have been guilty of this myself, so I'm going to put myself in the sissy passage, amen? Look at this. This is what sissy preachers will do, and I'm going to course correct today, and just as Tim and Diana mentioned earlier, it's important that if you've said something wrong, to correct yourself, amen? Amen? And I think I have misapplied this passage in the past, not in a way that would make it heretical, but confusing in the minds of the believer. So let me address how some sissy pastors will address this passage in Ephesians. They will read verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And then what they'll do is they'll quickly go back to verse 21 in order to kind of calm everybody down, where it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. In other words, it'll go something like this. You know, all men love verse 22, but conveniently skip verse 21, where we are told to both submit one to another. Now again, we are told in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. No one's doubting that, amen? But let's analyze the verses correctly. Verse 21 is the opening statement. Notice in verse 20, you have a, a, uh, a semicolon. And then in verse 21, we have this opening statement that introduces a brand new section. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's the opening statement. Then, verses 22 through 25 are Paul's explanation of how both parties, husbands and wives, are to obey verse 21. Let me say that again. Verse 21 is the opening statement. It's the introduction to this section. And then verses 22 through 25 are Paul's explanation as to how both husbands and wives are to obey verse 21. In other words, the woman obeys by submitting to her husband as unto the Lord. And then the man submits by not being a proud, selfish, abusive jerk, but rather a loving husband who protects and provides for the wife and family. Now, let me be clear. The husband doesn't submit by obeying his wife. He submits by denying self and putting his wife and children first. We know this is correct because of the analogy Paul gives us in this chapter concerning Christ's relationship to the church in the context. So I want you to think about this. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God is only in the context of a husband and a wife doing what they are respectively supposed to be doing. The wife submits to her husband as unto the Lord, and the husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church in everything. Now, think about this. Does anybody really believe, if you continue with the analogy about Christ and the church, does anybody really believe that Christ submits to the church in the same manner as the church submits to Christ? Think about that. That's the analogy. So if there's mutual submission for the husband and wife, then the analogy breaks down because Christ does not submit to the church. It's a different type of a role that Christ has towards the church. Amen, amen, amen. So no one should walk out of here thinking that Christ submits to the church in the same manner as the church submits to Him. And that's kind of the way we would have to look at this chapter if we just assumed that the submission was mutual. No, no. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord, and then the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body, and we are supposed to love our wives even as Christ also loved the church. So the wife submits to her husband, and the husband submits 
by denying himself and putting his family ahead of himself. And by the way, that's exactly how the analogy goes because Christ Jesus denied himself and put his bride first ahead of himself. That is how Christ did it, and that is our example, men. And listen to me, fathers, you must rule the house. Number two, here's the second thing I would suggest to you, how to not raise sissies, but raise saints. Number two, if you can, homeschool your kids. If you can, homeschool your kids. There is nothing more counterproductive than to instill biblical moral values in the hearts and minds of your children at home only to have them all undermined and devalued at a government-funded public institution. Say amen. You say, well, I, I don't understand that preacher. Well, I'm telling you how you ought to understand it because that is what has happened. If the China virus of the last several years has taught us anything, it's just how indoctrinating and how insidious many public teachers tend to be. Now, again, I have to offer a caveat here, lest somebody walk out of here all hurt. Yes, there are good Bible-believing public school teachers. I know of at least two, one that's retired and one that is still teaching. I understand that uh, we probably did not have a bad experience because, well, we grew up in a different time. And we didn't have many of the trash that is being introduced just really in the last five years to our kids. But let me just say this. Many of these teachers tend to be leftist atheists who see themselves as agents of change to the culture. And the most effective way to change the culture is to change the way people think at a very young age. When we think of critical race theory and gender grooming or descriptive sex acts being taught to kids today as young as grade school, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we might have been repulsed. But today it is an everyday thing. Uh, if you've ever watched C-SPAN or some of those other uh, news programs where you can watch parents address a school board, and it's so funny to me that the same school boards that okay the trash textbooks that go into the schools will shut down a parent for reading that same approved textbook to them because of the descriptive material in it. <laughs> Help me to understand that rationale. You approve of it for our grade schoolers and junior highers and our high schoolers, but yet you object to a, an adult parent addressing adults in a school board meeting because the information is too descriptive? Again, stop sending your kids to government-funded indoctrination camps that undermine biblical values and common decency that a civil society must have in order to be civil. Don't let them redefine civility. Now you say, all right, preacher, is there a caveat to this thing about, not, uh, about homeschooling? Well, in the least, if you can't homeschool them, and you just happen to have a boatload of money hanging around, send them to a solid Christian school where the Bible is the final authority and not secular textbooks. Amen. Now, let me also offer a caveat on top of the caveat. Not every Christian school is really, really Christian. So be careful about the kind of Christian school that you send your kid to because you want to check out what they believe. A lot of Christian schools will just put the title Christian somewhere to give you this feeling of, oh, relief, it's going to be okay. It might be better 
than some of the government-funded schools that are out today, but it may be just a tad better, but not a whole bunch better. So if you can't homeschool your kids, then at least send them to a solid Christian school where the values that you are instilling in them and the values that the church is instilling, instilling in them will not be devalued and undergirded, uh, excuse me, uh, undermined by those in public schools. Thirdly and finally, I want you to listen to this. Go to Joshua 24. I need both you men and women. There's only two of you anyway, because there's only two genders, amen. I cannot believe that in my 20 years of ministry, I have to say that. Joshua 24, last chapter of the book of Joshua. I want you to read this verse with me, Joshua 24, verse number 15. The Bible says this. Joshua's talking. He says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Catch Joshua's declaration. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Here's my third and final recommendation. No man will become a husband of God just because the wife wants him to be or allows him to be. No man will become a husband of God just because the wife wants him to be or allows him to be. The reason why I started off with Joshua chapter 24, verse 15 is because that was Joshua's conviction. Miss Joshua didn't say that. Miss Joshua followed Mr. Joshua, because that's the biblical parameter, amen. But Joshua was the one who said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, I need to remind you, ladies, that conviction proceeds from the heart, or else any attempt at change is in vain. Wives, you can pray for your husbands, which I encourage that you do. You can fast for your husbands, which I encourage you to do. But in order for that husband to be what God intends for him to be, it must come from his heart. And God must do that convicting work. Men, listen to me. You cannot raise a godly family in a confused culture without being actively involved and zealous members of a solid Bible-believing church that is led by a pastor who is comfortable in his own manhood. Let me say that one more time. Listen to me, men, leaders of your homes. You cannot raise a godly family in a confused culture that is constantly changing without being actively involved and zealously a member of a solid Bible-believing church that is led by a pastor who is comfortable in his own manhood. Steer clear of the skinny jeans-wearing metrosexual pastors who can fit in pants that would normally be worn by women. Steer clear of that because... They are gender-bending, whether you realize it or not. Steer clear of the pastors who are using words and verbiage uh, to somehow not offend the congregant because the culture has influenced that pulpit. Be careful about that kind of stuff. Don't consider that introductory Christianity. It's not introductory Christianity. Let me tell you what introductory Christianity is. Getting saved and reading the whole Bible. Not just segments of it, but the whole Bible. You know the Bible is, well, the whole Bible is Christianity. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, I, I'm, I just got introduced to Christianity. What should I do? Read the Bible. Well, what parts of the Bible? Well, you know, you can read this part and this part. Just read the whole thing because some, somewhere along the way it's going to offend you. Somewhere along the way, something in that Bible is going to offend you, and something the preacher is going to say is going to offend you, and somebody somebody in the congregation is going to say something that's going to offend you, and at some point, you need to not be a Christian snowflake either. 
And I'm telling you right now, the, the world has its church. It's called government. In fact, they are... In the process now, unless we can get Congress to act quickly, they're in the process of setting up a final authority called a Ministry of Truth. Now, we're calling it that because if you've read Orwell's 84, that's what that was called. But they're setting up a Ministry of Truth where they can sit in judgment and scrutinize your articles and your Facebook posts and the information that you are able to send to determine on their end as the final authority which is accurate and which isn't accurate. And so they've put this Mary Poppins woman, I forget her name right now, J Jankowitz, in charge of this thing, and she herself is a huge disseminator of disinformation. You cannot make this stuff up, man. That's like saying, we're going to make Hitler the head of the ministry of the Jewish people. Yes, you know, that's, that's, that'll work. That should be effective right there. That should be good. Yeah, we're going to make the head of the Ku Klux Klan uh, the outreach to the African American community. I mean, come on! <laughs> Dummies! Like, we can't see this? I'm telling you that this ministry of disinformation, or whatever they're calling it, you know at some point it is going to reach its tentacles into the church pulpits, because some of the things that we preach out of this Bible is completely contrary to what the culture is teaching about everything else. So it won't be long before the Mayorkas of the world or the Mary Poppins of the world will reach into the churches because they're, quote, all 501c3 and under the government anyway, and they're going to be able to come in and they're going to be able to say, you can't teach two genders because we don't teach two genders. You can't teach homosexuality is wrong. You can't teach that. You can't. It's misinformation. Now you say, all right, preacher, what's the summary today? Men desire to be what God wants you to be. Now let me summarize this with a few things. As I summarize it, I want you to listen to these quick takeaways. This is something I can learn and you all can learn from. Say no to your kids. And don't bother with explanations as to why you said no. Say amen, men. Say no to your kids. And when they ask why, you just say, because I said so. Simple. Very easy. Now, it's so easy for me to say that because I have Serena. I have such a hard time saying no to her because she's so pretty. And she reminds me of me. Number two, you set the dress code, not them. You set the dress code. Listen, they're in your home. You set, I'm not saying that you have to be like, you know, bless God, you're going to dress like your Fonzie from the happy days. You don't have to do that. Obviously, that was that time. Amen. This is not 1955. So you don't have to dress like that. Unless you're one of those swinger guys that, uh, you know, likes the, that decade and you dress like that. A greaser. That's fine. Uh, you don't have to dress in bell bottoms, even though evidently they've come back. I don't know why. Whoever did, that man needs to be put to death. I, they're disgusting. Disgusting. I don't know who would want those things at all. 
You, yes, well, they belong on a ship out on the ocean. But you set the dress code and not them. Number three, you set the standards, not them. You're coming to church. You're going to read your Bible with me. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You say, I don't want to. I get it. I understand it weighs on you. It taxes you. It, bre- it beats you down. But you've got to show them that you are a rock. You set the standards for them, not them. You let them know where they're going to church, not them! You be the example and try not to be the hypocritical one. You be the example and try not to be hypocritical. This is very complicated because sometimes as sinful individuals, well, we can be hypocritical. This will hurt you and drag the name of Christ through the mud in the process. So don't do that if you can help it. You say, all right, preacher, what's the conclusion? Here's the conclusion. If you apply these basic truths to your household, men, you will more than likely be raising saints instead of raising sissies. So preacher, I don't like that language. Well, then find a church that has watered down and has focused driven words because it's not this one. Now, let me say, I appreciate I feel like I'm part of John Hagee's church again. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. He'll say something good instead of saying amen. They all clap for him. But anyway, I'm also not that fat. But anyway, but here's what I want to just say to you men. This culture is, is, is trying to demasculate you. They're trying to take the teeth out of biblical fatherhood. Do not let them do that. Do not let your kids see a demoralized father who is feckless, who cannot lead his family. Be a biblical father. Look up here. There's no way around this truth. If you just do it this way, God's way. I didn't say it's easy. Oh, Pastor said, was it? You're a fool. I did not say that. It is complicated to navigate in any generation biblical parenting. It's becoming increasingly harder today, but in every generation, we've all had our complications. It's hard to say to your kids no and to help them to understand that I am your mom, I am your dad, I'm not your friend. I'll give you this last example and I'll close because i got to run to CB. Mrs. Crowther was my third grade teacher. I loathed her. She was a heavy set woman with a wart right here. It wasn't just a wart, it was a raised wart, maybe about a quarter of an inch. Big wart. When she turned, I went like this. (laughs) But (laughs) Mrs. Alder, when she laughed, she would go (laughs) like that. I don't know why she did that, but she did that. I, to this day, remember, (laughs) ha! All right, it would be more like this, (laughs) ha! But anyway, if you're looking for PC, there's another church. Anyway, let's move on. (laughs) I did not like Mrs. Crowther in third grade. She, this was at a time in American history where even if you did not know how to do math, you still had to come to the front chalkboard and write out the problem. So 25 kids, 30 kids in class, here I go up to the blackboard, and I'm in third grade trying to figure out a math problem, and I have to work it out in front of everybody. We can't do that today, because that would just totally mess them up. They'd need a week off just to get over that. But (laughs) I got up, I totally butchered it up, and she's sitting over there in her chair just judging every little, no, it doesn't go there, Jerry. 
No, the line go. No. And then you could hear a couple of kids. Jerry doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> Duh, I didn't know what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. But anyway, that's why God put me with a Texas instrument over here, Rita. So I'm over here doing this, doing this. You know, I, I'm embarrassed to death. It didn't matter. Listen, Mrs. Crowther pushed her students to learn. She did not care if we loathed her. By the way, she was a godly woman, Christian woman, went to Pioneer Baptist Church, sang in the choir, was at church every service. She wasn't mean on purpose, but she definitely had an agenda. <laughs> but it wasn't until I graduated that I started to appreciate Mrs. Crowther. Mrs. Crowther also kept back, I know this is going to sound really complicated, kids, but there was a time when if you did not accomplish the work in third grade and they're not going to just push you to fourth, they would hold you back and you would go through third grade again. So <laughs> Stephen Nodwell was a redheaded friend of mine. He had freckles. He reminded me of a male Pippi Longstocking. But anyway, <laughs> Stephen Nodwell and I were good friends in third grade. But I went to fourth grade. But Stephen Nodwell got kept back into third grade. Stephen Nodwell did not like that. Stephen Nodwell, at our graduation, did not even get called up. Oh my gosh, what, what happened to him? He's actually a successful guy right now, owns his own business. You say, why? Mrs. Crowther didn't care and actually looked to his well-being, even though at the moment he didn't think that. Amen. Stephen Nodwell today, I'm Facebook friends with him, he's not exactly where he needs to be with the Lord, <laughs> but he's a successful businessman making way more money than I'm making. And I'm not making much. You say, why? Because a teacher didn't care about popularity, didn't care about being a friend, but wanted to be a teacher. Sometimes I see myself as Mrs. Crowther, and sometimes you have to see yourself as Mrs. Crowther. Just deal with with whatever happens at the moment and pray to God that they get it later. Dad, that begins with you. Let's pray. Father, and Father, we're thankful, Lord, for your word. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, you would, uh, Lord, just first and foremost, Lord, speak to the hearts of the dads in this congregation. Father, there's so many folks that aren't here today. I pray, Lord, that that maybe they're listening in today. But Father, this is such a necessary topic for, for fathers. And Lord, we miss so much if we don't apply the biblical order. The culture doesn't care about the organized neutral family. They, they don't care. They don't care about the family structure. A mom and a dad is the ideal, but the world today doesn't care about that. Father, these folks in this room and in this congregation need to apply the biblical standard. And Father, I pray this morning that you would touch the hearts of dad and then also touch the heart of mom. There are two qualifiers in that passage in Ephesians. Wives that submit to their husbands as unto the Lord, and husbands who love their wives as Christ loved the church. He's not selfish. He's not in it for himself. He's all about his wife and all about his family. And Father, I pray that you would have your will with just the families we have in here today to be the leaders they need to be, starting with the men. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning. As Brother Sherlock plays, if God's touched your heart today,
I pray you'd come to the altar, deal with that this morning. If God hasn't touched your heart, then don't deal with it. You may be seated this morning. Thank you very much for being so attentive. I encourage you to be back tonight at 5 o'clock. And I encourage you to be back tonight. We'll have a, a good message this evening. Uh, my family is going to be rushing into the Buick here in just a few moments. So uh, try not to catch us on our way out and say, Pastor, can I have 45 minutes of your time? I, I, need, I need to get over there. This is the final service, so you can appreciate that. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity, uh, Father, to uh, preach your word today. Father, I pray again, Lord, the Holy Spirit of God would uh, place that into our hearts and our consciousness, Lord, and help us, Father, as men, first and foremost, to apply these truths and then to act on them. And then, Father, for our ladies, Lord, to do what they're supposed to do in this biblical order as well. Father, we all have a God-given sovereign order. And, Father, we just need to do what we were asked to do. And Father, it'll work out so much better in the end if we just listen to your word. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it all. Amen. Lord bless.